Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Digital and Social Media Sports Podcast. I am your host, Neil Horowitz. You can find me on Twitter, NJH287, and be up on LinkedIn as well, where I post more content. Visit the website, dsmsports.net, and of course, check out the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. What an awesome show today. Um, you'll be able to tell in this interview, I was legit psyched to be able to talk to Jamie Mottram. He is the president of Breaking Tea. He is just a veteran and leader in the sports digital social media space, and it's just a fantastic conversation. You're going to love it. I loved it. Could have talked for hours more, so stick around for a fantastic conversation with Jamie. But first, this episode's helpful tool. This episode's helpful tool helps uh, with TikTok a little bit. Everyone's trying to learn and, and get the best of TikTok and be able to discover what's really working on the platform. And of course, there's no uh, substitution really just spending time on the platform. It can be very time-consuming, as uh, many of us know, but scrolling the feed, looking at various industries, looking at um, ads and as well as trends that are performing, looking at sounds that are performing, how people are using those sounds. But TikTok introduced a new feature for pro accounts, which uh, if you don't have a pro account, I definitely recommend uh, switching to a pro account. You don't need to do anything besides make the setting in your account. And check out the Business Creative Hub. It's in within the business suite. And it shows you three categories of popular content. One is just trending content among businesses and brands. Another is engaging content from businesses, so some of the top performing content over time. Uh, and then lastly is the most engaging and trending stuff uh, from the community, the community at large, kind of what's going big on the platform, what's going big on TikTok at that time. Uh, really interesting little space. Again, not a substitution, substitution for spending a lot of time just scrolling the platform and getting to know it, let alone trying to get to know it in real time and keeping up with the trends. But this is one way to really help you get some ideas and inspiration for what's working for professional and brand accounts as well as uh, what TikTok is putting in front of its most important users, arguably, or really its most important users are the creators, but a, a big cohort of users that it definitely wants to, uh, to help use the platform. So check it out. It is the TikTok Business Creative Hub located in the business suite of your TikTok app. But more importantly, stick around because this is just a tremendous conversation with Jamie Mottram, president of Breaking Tea. Back with today's guest, I am so psyched to have him on the podcast. I was just telling him that I love what he's doing at Breaking Tea. I'm so passionate about the space. I'm joined on the podcast today by Jamie Mottram. He is the president of Breaking Tea. Welcome to the podcast today, Jamie. Thanks, Neil. Good to be here. Really psyched to pick your brain. You have an incredible background, and Breaking Tea is one of those brands that, and whenever something big is happening, somehow you guys are always on the spot, able to really operate within the at the speed of culture, at the speed of sports. So psyched to learn all about it, but um, also want to hear about you and your and how you got to where you are today. So tell us about your career path, um, the stops along the way, um, making making the jump to Breaking Tea, and any tips for folks that want to uh, work in your space. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think I've had a combination of like lucky breaks, um, you know, fortunate, you know, bounces along the way. And then, you know, a combination of that plus trying to make the most of it. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up wanting to be in sports media, you know, since I was a kid, you know, that I remember my college essay, it was like, uh, my two first loves are baseball and journalism, you know, and I was just really passionate about those things. And in college, I, I wanted to become a sportscaster. This was the nineties where like sports center anchors were rock stars, you know, Patrick, <laughs> Keith Olbermann. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you just like me and my college buddies would just sit and watch sports center all day, like the same show, you know, all morning long until you can like recite the lines back to them. Uh, so I was just so into that, but then I came out of school and I was just kind of wayward. Like I didn't want to go to a podunk town and take a weekend sports reporter job. Like, you know, I didn't want to pay my dues basically. <laughs> um, so I was just looking for random work, uh, in the DC area. And I remember, uh, one of my job interviews that I went on and a, a job offer that I got was with the NRA as like a PR guy for the NRA. And like, if you know me, that's hilarious. Like I've never owned, owned a gun. I've never grown up in like, I've never been in like gun culture. Um, I, I'm at, at best, like, you know, medium on guns, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, I just didn't know what I wanted to do, but luckily uh, I found a job posting on monster.com for wall street sports. 
and Wall Street Sports was like this fantasy sports stock exchange. It was kind of like NBA Top Shot, but without the video highlights because you could like buy and sell shares of players and uh you know kind of gain or lose based on on the market activity and their performance on the field and the hype around different guys it's a long defunct now should yeah. probably bring it back um but that like just finding that job on monster like put me on this kind of sports digital media path that i wasn't really on until I got out of college, you know, I mean, th mm. think back to 99, 2000, um, you know, there was nothing internet about my background, about my internships, about my education, about my interests. I just happened to find this job at a dot com and that made all the difference. Um, you know, cause going from, from wall street sports.com, you know, put me on a path that led to AOL, you know, AOL was, headquartered in uh northern virginia mm -hmm. um you know i was in dc so um and AOL was like thriving at the time you know oh, yeah. they had 25 million paid subscribers so 25 million people paying like 24 dollars a month for dial-up internet wow <laughs> it was just <laughs> crazy um they're flush with cash but i was just focused on um you know, sports content, like initially it was, it was not sports. It was like co concert reviews. And like, I was like writing about music, but I got in like a sports editing role. And again, that was like another kind of like springboard into something different. You know, now it wasn't just about internet during this time, like the early two thousands, it became about blogging. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of got into sports blogging um, and podcasting at AOL as a result of just like what was going on, um, you know, digitally at that time with digital content and what AOL's needs were, um, you know, so that, that kind of led to creating this, this, um, like large scale group blog called fan house yeah, that, totally. that, uh, was kind of a, a big, it was a big deal for me. It was a big deal for AOL at the time, you know, in like the mid two thousands. Um, and it caught the attention of some, some industry people, you know, in the sports media world, um, notably Dave Morgan, who was heading up Yahoo sports at the time. Mm -hmm. And, and Yahoo sports is like battling ESPN, um, you know, competitively on the journalism front, like who's going to break stories. And then also on the audience front, you know, with, as measured by com score media metrics, ESPN was always number one. Yahoo sports is always number two. And Dave looked at what we were doing at fan house and was like, you know, we've got all these great columnists and reporters at the time. Yahoo sports had a stable, like Adrian Wojnarowski was their yeah. NBA guy. Jeff Passan was their MLB guy, you know, and like kind of on down the line. Um, they were like, we'd love to combine what you're doing with fan blogging you know, at AOL, which is a little bit more like commentary and humor and kind of like web culture, you know, mm -hmm. viral moments, um, do that here. So, you know, I went to Yahoo to do that in the late two thousands. Uh, it, it did really well. You know, we, we started beating ESPN every month and in audience, nice. um, yeah. And, that, and it was like, it was definitely one of those moments too, where like, I don't know, I guess, it's long enough ago. I can tell the stories of like the, the Yahoo sports all hands where we'd all get together, you know, once a year and like toast to, you know, beating the shit out of ESPN, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And now a lot of those people are at ESPN, <laughs> right? That's awesome. <laughs> um, you know, and, and ESPN's thriving, but, uh, you know, so did that at Yahoo. Uh, but as times changed, you know, like, blogging started kind of evolving into like social media, you know, and like, yeah, I mean, I've, I've have been blogging actively or otherwise since like 2003, but you know, it made a lot less sense to blog once Twitter came around, you know? And so, and then a lot less sense once, you know, Instagram came around and on and on and on. Um, 
so the work I was doing at Yahoo started to evolve more into, into, you know, social media, social content. Um, and I ended up going from Yahoo to Gannett, which owns USA Today and about a hundred plus other papers across the country. Um, in 20, when did I go there? 2012, 2013. Um, and at that point it was like, Buzzfeed and other, you know, Huffington Post, um, you know, other notable digital publications uh, were kind of blossoming. Uh, Vox Media, you know, and it was yeah, yeah. all about like social, like content that could be distributed and discovered socially. And then as things evolved further, like could be just consumed on social platforms. So it became like this era of distributed content. So a lot of the work that I did at Gannett and USA Today is still in sports media, but like the the methodology and like the, the, be, the consumer behavior kept changing. So it became more about, you know, how can how can you engage audiences and inform and entertain audiences where they are, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, et cetera. Um, and that was a lot of the work that I ended up doing at Gannett uh, up until a few years ago when I left the world of sports content and entered the world of sports commerce at uh, breaking tea. I love it. Uh, I, I tried to just give you 20 years and like, well, it was nowhere. It was way longer than 20 seconds, but at least it was shorter than 20 minutes. Oh no, anyone that knows me knows I, I was, I was biting my tongue not to ask a billion questions about, about your pathway and, and all the stops you had. Cause it's, it's so interesting to me that you've seen this, this evolution take place of having a, a a site that really was a, a one-stop shop. I think about AOL fan house, even as that came up, when I said, when you signed into AOL, you got, you, you got right to their, their homepage. You saw their news, just like people that had like Yahoo mail later were, you know, yeah, that was the first thing they saw. So like you own those eyeballs, the 25 million eyeballs or, um, or your first stop that before the World Wide web came along. And then you talked about, I love the term distributed con distributed content of now we're not just using social to, amplify our content we are thinking about social first for our content and I, I, even when you were uh, let's talk about the tail end there too with with yahoo um and or with Gannett rather as well uh it was there still a a mandate to hey the goal of social is to push site traffic or was there that light bulb that said hey we need to think social first consuming the content there and what was like the long-term outlook for that in terms of you know driving revenue at the end of the day yeah, I mean that is, that is such a tough, uh, such a such tough terrain to navigate. You know, do you want to pull everybody onto your platform where you can control the relationship with the user and the time spent is more highly monetized, and maybe you've got a subscription aspect to it that can bolster your business. Uh, or do you want to make it easy for everybody and give them what they want, where right. they want it? You know, like it's just, it's just tough, you know? So Gannett was a legacy media company. It is a legacy media company born out of print. And uh, it's hard for Gannett or any legacy company with its pre-existing uh, not pre-existing conditions, but pre-existing business conditions. Right. Um, you know, to say instead of, you know, getting uh, a million views for this article at a, uh, you know, at a cost per thousand views of, you know, $8 or whatever it is that we might get on our own website or in our own app, we're going to just let people read it on Facebook instant articles, or we're just going to let people watch the video on Instagram mm -hmm. where it's either not monetized at all or it's very lowly monetized. And at least you're serving and engaging the user and creating like a, a stronger relationship with the audience that maybe could lead to future earnings. Um, yeah. So that, that equation is just so hard to strike the right balance, especially when competitively, you know, like at the time, um, you know, that uh, I was at Gannett, like in the, let's say the teens, um, like Bleacher Report, for example, was putting a lot of their content on the platforms. Mm -hmm. And that could be highlights, that could be graphics, 
could be articles, whatever. Um, and they could kind of afford to do that, you know, cause they had, were less of a legacy publisher. You know, they were a digital first publisher. They'd been acquired by Turner. It's just a whole different equation, you know? So it's, it's, it's not that the playing field is imbalanced. It's just like, you know, everybody is kind of bringing something different to it and trying to get something different out of it. You know, for, so for a bleacher, maybe their business was more, and I'm speaking out of turn. I mean, I, I don't know what their strategy was, but maybe their business was more about building up large followings, building up engagement and hoping to monetize those relationships down the road. Whereas like an ESPN might've been more about like protecting the, the egg, you know, protecting the direct to consumer uh, or di- protecting the um, you know, cable subscription business that they yeah. had no, and I trying to know. shepherd it towards a direct to consumer relationship with streaming services, streaming subscriptions, you know, and maybe they didn't want to give it away on social, you know? Um, so yeah. they were going to make you or encourage you to click onto the site, click onto the app, you know, go behind the paywall to get what you wanted. Um, you know, so it, 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 I could just go, I mean, I'm kind of rambling at this point, but that, that period, like the, two, the 2000s and into the teens were pretty clean. Like you kind of wanted to get as much traffic as possible to your website. <laughs> you know, there was like, that was an obvious objective. Um, but then it became a lot more confusing over the last you know, five to 10 years. No, totally. I mean, I, I think back to the time I spent on, on the team side as well. And we often did have those conversations, especially I was around at a time when native video first arose. And it's like, do we post this native video here on Facebook where we know it's going right. to perform well at the time? Or do we you know, post a, a clip and then drive back to the site or drive back to the site altogether? And those mm-hmm. are real conversations that to your point, like when you have a legacy model that you're trying to hold up and you, even look at, you know, the, of course, the people that have not cut the cord yet, the people trying to keep that cable model or, or, or bundle model alive. Mm-hmm. It's you know, how do we protect that versus throwing it out the window and going all into, you know, this new approach, like, like a bleacher um, was doing at the time and with mm-hmm. no guarantee of being able to monetize that the same way in the future, let alone reach the same levels that you're accustomed to. So yeah, we can spend all day on this stuff. Well, and you're always looking at, you're always looking at like the other side of the fence, you know, like trying to keep up with the Joneses and the Joneses could be Buzzfeed. It's like, Oh my gosh, this is incredible. They, they like manufacture virality and get like millions of views on their stories, or it could be bleach report. You know, it's like, Oh my gosh, house of highlights, uh, you know, like is just an an Instagram juggernaut and they've created so much engagement on that platform. It's wild. Or the Joneses could be the New York times and look how successful their subscription business is. And it's like, you can't keep up with everybody. Like keeping up with the Joneses is, is for the birds. So you just kind of pick what you're good at and what it is, you know, you're going to focus on and go after and differentiate with and and find success with. Yeah. And and you look at the, the, especially the speed that sports moves and in the moments like if there is a big play or um, a big news, big news that drops, you're not going to want to click t- and read behind someone's paywall. Yeah, you know, that's just not the way that we consume now. And and I, I I think you know top of mind for me is is you mentioned Woj, Adrian Wojnarowski, huh. being at Yahoo, and now of course being one of ESPN's lead guys, probably him and Schefter and Jeff Passan on the on the baseball side, just owning that that scoop, owning that information, and yep. something that's always top of mind for me is what is the value of being of, of that, that, that Woj bomb? You know, how mm-hmm. does, how does that, how does ESPN justify or, or monetize that moment? And then how quickly and ephemeral that moment is before everyone curates it and already knows it at that point. So mm-hmm. uh, is there, is that still a lingering question for sports media and the, the industry overall of, we understand that I mean, Twitter as well as Twitter at large, it owns these moments, but maybe isn't monetizing to the degree they should, given how, how much they control the conversation and the way the information flows. So I'm rambling now, but I would love to get your, your insight onto, is that kind of still a lingering question and issue of how do we maximize that, that first tweet, that first Woj bomb? Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting with, I mean, he's, he's had a wild career. When I was at Yahoo, he was kind of doing everything. I remember like Jordan's 
Hall of Fame induction ceremony, Woodrow, like a scathing column. <laughs> you know, it was like hilarious and mean. <laughs> um, but he was kind of doing everything, you know, it was like breaking news, analyzing the game, opining, you know, he's kind of a jack of all trades. And now it's, it's more about, uh, you know, the reporting and, and dropping the bombs. But there's you know, ongoing debate about like, should he be doing that on Twitter? Should he file a story first? And it's, it's kind of like become a little obsolete. I feel like if you have news to break, you break it. <laughs> you know, it's about you're building someone else will before you. You're, you'll get beat otherwise. Yeah, it's about like building up the brand, and he's done an incredible job of that. And I mean, passing it as well. And and I know Jeff a little bit, so I you know I keep that in mind. But he's like, uh, he kind of does it all still, you know. Um, but if he has news to break, you know, it's he's going to get it out there. I think before uh, you know one of his competitors, it doesn't matter which which platform that's on. But you know, it's different. It's different across the board. I mean, yeah, you know, ESPN might tuck one of his columns behind the paywall, mm-hmm. um, and you know, because there is like a specific and and like unique value to that you know, to his writing and like somebody else might be writing a column, but it's going to be different. It's going to be different style and substance. It's not, it's not commodity. Um, so, you know, I, I think for, for any, any ESPN or anyone who cares about the subscription business, um, you know, you do have to be strategic about what you're going to tuck behind that wall. Um, and I think at this point now, I hope consumers can understand and respect that. Like this is not free. You know, for a long time, we kind of expected and demanded that our content on the Internet be free. And I, I think behaviors are shifting to acknowledge that, like, this stuff is expensive. And unless we just don't want there to be, you know, news outlets or media outlets any, any longer, um, at least in some cases, we have to pay for it. Yeah, it, I think it's, it's not always driving someone to a gated piece of content, of course, it, like, like you said, like Woj by dropping Woj bombs is building a relationship and, and ultimately mm-hmm. building a brand himself mm-hmm. so that when I want to you know, listen to a podcast for the NBA, I'm going to listen to Woj's podcast because I know he's the most informed. Mm-hmm. I'm going to turn on ESPN when, when Woj has a report because I'm waiting for his sports center hit so he can, he can give more information. So there, there's so much of that. The way I choose, the way that consumers, fans, myself uh, being the example here, chooses to consume their sports media is affected by those ephemeral Woj bombs, even if the tweet itself, unless you NFT it, um, to make a joke, uh, isn't necessarily directly monetized uh, or have that d- direct off to it. You know, what's interesting though, is like, like I mentioned, like we're used to everything being free on the internet. And I think that's because everything started out as like being free on the internet. Uh, and now it's kind of shifted. Like you expect to have to subscribe to the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the New Yorker or ESPN. Like eventually you expect to like hit these walls. And, and, and by eventually, I mean like not that far down the path, like on the, like your fifth click <laughs> or yeah. whatever with them, you know, so you kind of expect that with written content and you've come to expect it to an extent with video content, um, you know, with streaming and all the different subscriptions we all have. But it's like the outliers here are like podcasting and social. Like I, I don't pay for like anything with podcast. I listen to a ton of podcasts and it's like all ad supported and I skip past all the ads if I'm being honest. So I kind of like, as a, like, I feel like we're conditioned to like expect podcasting to be free and social. Like, you know, you can follow anybody on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Um, So that it's interesting. And I bet those things will eventually shift in much the same way. Totally. Yeah, I mean, the, the internet was everything was free on the internet until until it wasn't, and podcasts are all free until until they're not. Um, and, and so that, that'll be it, it. Will be an interesting space to watch for sure. And I, I do want to pivot a little bit. We're having a great conversation here with, with Jamie Matra, I'm president of Breaking Tea. I want to talk about the the work you did do at Gannett and how that may inform you know what you're doing today as well. And that it really is keeping up with just how quickly things move in and out of the, of the sports zeitgeist of the cultural zeitgeist. It, it, it may be a massive, you know, a, a major player, a massive dunk or whatever it might be. And it also might be completely non uh, on the field related. It might just be a, a meme or something that occurs uh, off the field. So, like what, what is the best way to keep up with that stuff? How do you know what ha- is going to have some lasting power? And, you know, mm-hmm. when, when you're at a Gannett or even at a breaking tea, like, what's the process like for recognizing that something is bubbling up and knowing that this is going to transcend just the, whatever, a couple hundred thousand people are watching this game live. Mm-hmm. 
Well, when we when I was at Gannett, like one of the first things we did there was we launched a website called For the Win. And For the Win, if you were to like boil it down, it's, it was kind of like the BuzzFeed of sports. And, I mean, maybe it still is. I mean, it's still going strong. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure if they ever secured the domain or if we ever secured the dom- domain. <laughs> For the win.com, FT, I think I remember FTW.com. Whoever the person was who was squatting on that, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, <laughs> it's still, it's FTW.com, the internet service for Fort Worth. Okay. <laughs> and it's like just the under construction website. <laughs> and for the win, is is also not working uh so they never got it i remember some i can't remember if it was ftw.com or for the win.com whoever was squatting on it wanted like six figures for the for the domain <laughs> and we were just like dude nobody even uses urls anymore <laughs> like just just let us have it but anyways if you just put ftw in your search bar you'll find it um but it was like the, the tagline was like what fans are talking about you know for the win uh was like social content that was all inspired by like trending moments like what's going viral like what the traditional water cooler topics are um in sports and so it was all about like content that was really relevant on social you know especially facebook and twitter at the time and it was about producing that content covering those moments covering the the stories in a way that was really shareable so that like our audience could distribute it on social and also really digestible and like easy to consume on phones. You know, so this all seems like old hat at this point, but we launched the site in 2013. So it was kind of like on trend at the time and it, mm. it became really successful. And, you know, we, we kind of modeled out how we could do for the win across all sorts of subject areas, across all sorts of markets we never really got there. Um, I think it's sort of a shame, but you know, you're working at a big corporation across a, several different uh, organizational lines. You you can't always get what you want. Mm-hmm. But but we had success with For the Win, and you know, like I said, it's still going. Um, and now, you know, what we do, but we didn't really care about like when we're making content coverage choices. We didn't really care about lasting like staying power you know it's like uh oh aaron Rodgers is hosting jeopardy tonight awesome you know like what what, what's the moment what's the hook let's let's do a story about that you know that somebody could get the gist of it and kind of pass it on uh in a delightful way so we didn't really think about that at for the win but now with breaking tea you know we're kind of doing a lot of the same stuff but in a a totally different format, you know, instead of articles or Instagram videos or whatever, it's your know, graphics to be printed on apparel, you know, t-shirts, hoodies, sometimes mugs and other drinkware, all that stuff. Um, and we have a much smaller team, you know, at for the win, we were, we had uh, a baseball writer and we had an editor, multiple editors, and we had different writers for each sport. And we had a larger you know, content organization that really was like thousands of people large when you totally zoom out. Um, and we use some tools to help make determinations, but at Breaking Tea, we don't have, you know, thousands of people. Uh, we have a small team that uses a social data platform that we've developed called CrowdBreak to identify things that are bubbling up and then sometimes things that are boiling over, you know? Um, and that part of, you know, that basically that's like our, our trend monitoring or our, our content discovery is, is crowd break. And if, if it doesn't matter if it's something happening in the WNBA or in college football or an Olympic sport, uh, you know, if something is happening, we're going to know about it early on. And then our team can make a determination out of that much smaller subset of the larger universe universe. And part of that determination is staying power, you know? So if, uh, if a team, you know, has a moment, a player has a moment and it's game two of the world series, well, that, we just know as humans that like, that's not going to have the same staying power 
as a moment in the deciding game of the World Series. You know? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. or if a player does something, but you know, they're brand new to the team or the league. Or maybe on the other end, like their contract's about to expire and they're expected to leave. You know, we know as humans, like that, that affects things that affects the shelf life that affects the market expected market impact. So it's this combination of social data analytics and then like editorial judgment um, that we use to kind of tee things up for our creative team. And then we can, capture whatever the moment is creatively in a way that fans are going to want to buy it and wear it. And, you know, maybe think fondly of uh, their new favorite t-shirt for a long time to come. Yeah. I I have some big picture questions, but I do want to sort of dive right into this process of like, what is it like when a moment breaks or when whether a crowd break score reaches that critical mass point, you're like, okay, let's do this. And then the creative conversation happens Mm-hmm. And the operations are taking place in the background to make sure that everything is done. Like what's that? Is there a war room like aspect to it? Is, is it constantly uh, multiple people are typing in Slack? All uh, that crazy <laughs> that you see, like what, what's that, yeah. what's that, uh, yeah. that, that, that status like, or that, that experience like? Yeah. I mean, well, just like, I don't know what day it was yesterday. Maybe it's like uh, Julian Edelman is, he's been cut by the Patriots. He's expected to retire. Multiple people are typing in Slack. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> It's like, you know, we we get the crowd break alert, you know, either before or right around when everybody's kind of discovering it, you know, they're, you know, just per the usual ways. And, um, you know, our team, our product development team is like, well, you know, tease that up in Slack. It's like, here's something on the NFL front we need to do. We're li- breaking tea happens to be licensed by the NFL PA. So that, that license is, enables us to use the name image likeness of all players across the league. Um, so it's, you know, teeing that up. The moment in this case is that like a somewhat legendary Patriots player is, is his time there is done. His watch is over. Um, so, but that doesn't make it very easy. Like what we should do creatively, you know? So the team kind of spitballs that, like, what are people saying on Twitter? Uh, what, what were his, his, the biggest moments of his career? Did he have a great nickname? What's the iconic imagery of him? You know, like, and I'm using Edelman way too much, you know what I mean? But like, um, I think what we ended up doing was, you know, commemorating the catch that he had in the Super Bowl, where it was like an impossible catch. Um, so, you know, our product team teased that up for our design team. Our design team comes up with a great graphic. Uh, we all kind of agree that it looks good and is ready to go. Uh, and we submit that to the NFL PA for approval within hours of the news breaking. And, uh, we have that approval and we go to market. Our goal is to go to market within 24 hours of something happening. So, you know, within 24 hours of that news breaking, we're selling, uh, you know, Julian Edelman, you know, legendary, uh, I think it was the legendary Julian Edelman is the name of the product. Mm-hmm. We're selling that in our website. We're, we're pulling all the levers for online distribution to get that in front of the right fans. Um, and, you know, we're talking to our different wholesale partners so that uh, brick and mortar retailers can have it in store while the, while the moment's still hot. Uh, at first, it just sounds like so much fun of having those like round table conversations of, okay, how do we commemorate this moment? How do we visualize this moment? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, let's talk a, a bit about the, d- the distribution strategy. Like, is it does most of the the uh, the traffic or the sales conversions? Is it a combination of SEO, as social referral, paid uh, paid social? Mm-hmm. What what tends to work the best for you? And, and you know, it, it does it vary by demographic even. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variation and a lot of nuance, but you know, just to. Um, you know, speak in broad strokes, most of our sales come from uh, e-commerce, from direct to consumer online sales. We used to be like, oh, like almost entirely e-commerce. It has shifted over time as we've matured and developed more wholesale relationships to be a little bit more of a split between e-commerce and wholesale to retailers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just talking about e-commerce specifically, 
you know, there's a bunch of different channels. Like we are not, you know, 50% plus anything, you know, there's no, there's no piece of the pie. that's you know, half the pie. Um, you know, we have, uh, a bunch of different organic, uh, sales channels. You know, we have a, a really large customer database, um, people that have bought from breaking tea before, and we know they're buying behaviors. If you bought a Patriot shirt before from us, right. uh, you're going to get an email about our new Edelman shirt. You know, like that, that's just a very simple thing that, that we do with each of our launches. We, we segment our customer database. Um, you know, we uh, have our own social followings, um, you know, we have our licensed partners. So like, you know, the NFL PA might, might, um, you know, be amplifying what we do. The players themselves might amplify what we do. There's just a lot of like, or, there's a lot of organic, I mean, organic social, uh, customer sharing our stuff on social. Like there's just a lot of organic behavior because everything we're doing is very fresh and timely. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, that's maybe point. every day, every day around, around every day around the calendar year, there's probably some number of people that are Googling Julian Edelman t-shirts, <laughs> but that number spikes on the day we happen to be releasing it because he's in the news, you know, like that. So we're aligned really well with consumer behavior uh, with search. We're aligned really well with consumer behavior on social, because think of all those Boston fans that are kind of like, repping Edelman in the wake of this news. Um, so they're, they're kind of distributing too. And so there's a lot of organic behavior and a lot of organic channels that are like email, social search. Sometimes we get um, media outlets, you know, so I don't know that the Boston Herald wrote about our shirt, but it's not uncommon for like local media to cover our product releases. Cause it just adds to the story. Um, is, is there, um, I, 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 you, know, you hear a lot of a lot of people thinking highly or having big eyes for a future of of uh, social media shopping, of Instagram shopping. But you look at the numbers, at least so far, there hasn't been a ton of adoption by brands yet. It's still a very small piece of the pie as the products and platforms evolve. Of course, uh, like is is social media shopping going to become a normal thing in the future? And I, how important is it for breaking tea uh, as opposed to say? you know, a more organic picture of just Julian Edelman hanging out in his backyard wearing a pair of jeans and you can buy those pair of jeans. <laughs> well, I think we get, I think we get a, a very high level of organic performance with social mm -hmm. because it's just like surprise and delight, you know, like, oh my gosh, this guy just threw a no hitter and here's a t-shirt that you know is in, in my timeline. A lot of impulse purchases um, that happen organically. But, but, but Jamie, that, that, that's still taking place off platform. It's not like using the, the native shopping tool, so to speak. Yeah, we're not really using any of the native shopping tools now, and there's different reasons for that. Like, I, I you know, not with not speaking with any great specificity about one platform yeah. or another, but like, you know, sometimes you might not, you know, own that relationship with the customer. Because, mm -hmm. because you're using the native tools or maybe sometimes, you know, there's a, a, a portion of the revenue that is, is being taken out of the transaction. Right. You know, um, there's just different aspects to it that don't make it totally attractive or, you know, push you, put you over the edge to, to do it in the first place. Right. Um, but, you know, we've, we've done more with, with, uh, you know, another big e-commerce channel is paid. You know, we started doing more paid social and search. Mm -hmm. um, we really took the opportunity during the pandemic to start doing that. We had never done anything paid until last last year. Um, you know, we just had more time and we had a greater need to drive e-commerce revenue. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that we undertook Um you know, last summer during the pandemic, uh, that, that has kind of helped us be stronger on the other side. I, I have so many directions. I want to head to, I know we only have a couple minutes left here with Jamie Machin, president of breaking tea. And, and let, let's talk about that big picture, that, that, uh, the dream that you had, that vision you had at, for the win at Gannett, um, of ultimately building out, you know, multiple 
similar iterations for other interest areas mm -hmm. is that in the, is that ultimately the vision for a, a company like breaking tea is, Hey, let's maximize when the latest person gets kicked off the bachelor. I, I don't watch the bachelor, but I know it's a crazy thing. Um, so like, just, get, get, what's, what's the vision look like for the future of ultimately monetizing real time culture for lack of a better way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've done some different things where we've crossed over into other like, you know, non sports, um, especially when the pandemic hit and live sports just stopped, you know I mean? That was like, we were getting real creative. We started doing classic moments. We became licensed by some different alumni associations. So we could do things like, um, you know, the, uh, what's, what's a good example, like the time Nolan Ryan got in a fist fight, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but then we also started doing like, you know, Tiger King inspired product and Hamilton inspired product, you know, history has its eyes on you, that sort of thing. It was still tied to the news cycle, but it was not necessarily sports. And then sports came back and we kind of, you know, got distracted, but everything we do could be extrapolated and kind of applied to different verticals, if you want to call them that. I mean, I think what we do works really well with pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we should, we should be partnered with Saturday Night Live. We should be working with NBC and doing like whatever the SNL like sketch du jour or like one liner of the week is like, we should be working on that together. Yeah. Uh, there's opportunity there. There's market opportunity. There's creative opportunity. Um, there's just like an, an, an e-commerce opportunity, another incremental revenue stream and another kind of marketing aspect to what, you know, SNL or, or The Bachelor or, you know, any original Netflix programming, you know, Bridgerton, <laughs> whatever it is, um, that we could apply our model to and, and we think it would work really well. Uh, we just have still, we're still realizing the opportunity with sports, you know, so we kind of want to focus on that. And it's just so clean, you know, like every, every moment, every trend kind of maps to a market or a team, you know, a fan base. Yeah. Um, it, there's group licensing dynamics that cover every team or every player, you know, there's, uh, sports specific, uh, retailers, you know, like there's just a lot of, uh, there's in venue retail. There's all these things that like kind of work with sports that we're still exploring. Um, and, and there's also like, you know, there's barriers to internationally as well. We started becoming licensed by some English premier league teams, for example, yeah. um, you know, and we're figuring that out. But, you know, a lot of the things I just said work really well. Like breaking tea would work really well with politics. But you kind of got to pick a side. Yeah. It's, I think it's real hard to play both sides. I mean, there's, it's certainly hard to play both sides in any, any sort of authentic way. But even if you wanted to be inauthentic, it would be hard to play in the political realm without picking a side or just trying to drive down the middle, which is hard too. Um, but you know, everything we do with our social data, our creative process, our operational capabilities, like every, it just it goes on and on, could be applied to politics. It's it's just a thorny area. <laughs> Is it is it a, a peril the way to go for the most part, or is there more like should you be like coffee mugs, refrigerator magnets, iPhone covers? I don't know. I don't know what the what the potential could be for beyond beyond apparel. Well, I'm drinking. I'm I'm drinking out of a breaking tea Yeti right now, and my <laughs> iPhone case has some as a like a breaking tea logo on it and my macbook is covered in breaking tea stickers <laughs> so there's like all sorts of different product categories and extensions i mean we we don't think of ourselves as a t-shirt company or we don't think of ourselves as a sports company we don't think of ourselves as a t-shirt company uh we think of ourselves as like a real-time merchandise company and i would i might even modify that because we started creating nft you know uh, we, we did our first NFT series ah, a week or two ago. Uh, and that's just digital art, you know, so it's transcending the tangible, you know? <laughs> um, and so, you know, we look at ourselves as like real time merchandise and it doesn't have to be sports. It doesn't have to be t-shirts, but the reality is no matter what we do, it always seems like about 80% of our sales come from sports t-shirts. <laughs> it's just such a great format for, you know, capturing these sort of moments and, and merchandising them.
Hey, it's, it's a way. For, so it's a it's a storytelling a mechanism. You walk around. You have you have you're you're labeling yourself, asking about this this t shirt, so I can tell the story and relive it and have those emotions. It's it's a, there's so much to mm-hmm. it. That's why I, I love what it represents too. All yeah. right, Jamie. I, I mean, so yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna just gonna say like it, it we are very experimental, we're very nimble, like not just in terms of like going to market within 24 hours, but, you know, if some opportunity emerges, um, you know, we're very quick to act and try it out, you know, and try it on. So um, that can lead you to some very surprising places. And uh, that's, that's part of what adds to the excitement. Oh, you're, you're, you're leaving us wanting more. I love it. it it's going to be fascinating to see the continued growth of breaking tea and, and just the space overall, but we are going to have some more fun with you in our quick hitter segment. So that's coming right up after okay. the episode's shareable stat. Just a phenomenal chat with Jamie Matram, president of Breaking Tea. A uh, really smart guy, really sharp, really gets the space. And of course, goes out saying Breaking Tea is really doing some interesting stuff with that real-time merchandise uh, business model. And Really cool to see what they're doing and to learn more about it from Jamie. But stick around because we're going to have some more fun with them in our quick hitter segment. But first, this episode's shareable stat. This is a shareable stat is about Discord. Um, Discord was in the news relatively recently, depending on when you're listening to this, with Mark Zuckerberg doing an interview with Casey Newton um, about Facebook and more importantly, uh, the or more uh, to the point, the recent audio uh, announcements they made for the new audio features, which are coming out soon and are going to compete with Discord's uh, talking service that that he was on, as well as the Clubhouse and Twitter spaces and whatnot. But most importantly, the conversation was on Discord uh, with Casey Newton on the side channel Discord server, which is the sort of paid conglomerate of Substack uh, writers that have partnered with Casey for people to subscribe to this exclusive subscriber-only Discord server. And to get this episode's terrible stat, finally, is 140 million. That's the number of active users on Discord, um, in, according to the most recent metrics. And of course, other news that came out about Discord was Microsoft is not going to be buying it for $10 billion, as was the rumor for a little while there. So Discord is on its own, may, may look to IPO in the future, but this is Social Media Sports Podcast. So what does that $140 million, um, number mean? We've seen some sports teams experiment a little bit on the platform. The Sacramento Kings consistently uh, do a good job on the platform, hosting um, some Q&As with some of their players and executives and, and coaches. And it's, it's an interesting place to help drive that community. So how can sports really crack that nut? 140 million uh, very community-driven users and uniting around interests oftentimes. Um, of course, gaming is is the kind of the OG of, of Discord. But it's a place where communities are starting to, to grow and to build. And it's a, you know some, something of a Reddit sibling, if you, if you will, but more focused on chat, on real-time connection, and yes, on this new audio space as well. So again, check out what the Kings, Sacramento Kings are doing if you like. I've tweeted a little bit about it myself. Uh, keep an eye out for other teams. There's been some European football clubs that have done some stuff on Discord as well. Uh, so it's a place where fans, where you're some of your most diehard fans, some of the most dedicated fans that want to connect with a community as passionate as they are, uh, it's a place to meet those fans and to engage them. Maybe even a place where you can you know, have a subscriber only or a season ticket holder only or digital membership only area to connect with some players and executives as well. So interesting space to watch for sure. But again, that shareable stat, 140 million active users for Discord according to the most recent metrics. And think about it, ponder it, talk about it. But stick around for some the quick hitters with Jamie Mottram of Breaking Tea. Right back from this episode's shareable stat, and I'm joined once again by Jamie Mottram. He is the president of Breaking Tea. Jamie had a tremendous conversation with you in the interview. Are you ready now for some quick hitters? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's roll. Number one, the sports moment from your childhood that you'd most want to be able to wear. Oh, man. Um, so we, we launched uh, a classics collection last summer, and we included a Will Clark 1989 shirt. Will Clark is my all-time favorite athlete. Nice. When I was 12, he was a god. I had his poster in my room. So we did this Will Clark shirt. We actually did it. You know, I, I have it, and, and Will Clark himself – wore it and sent us a picture so that was like my childhood you know weird dream come true (laughs) that's so cool uh all right number two for you jamie uh tell me your favorite or favorites among the breaking t-shirts or or apparel of all time which are one or two that stick out in your mind 
Well, my favorite modern player is Juan Soto. And when they made that World Series run a year and a half ago, uh, the Soto shuffle became a big deal. Um, You know, so we did a shirt like do the Soto shuffle and it kind of shows him shuffling. And like we sold that at Nats Park. And I just love that T-shirt. I love Juan Soto. My daughter loves Juan Soto. I want Juan Soto to be my son-in-law and I I will (laughs) wear that shirt under my tuxedo. (laughs) So at the wedding <laughs> and that that just deepens the, the the fan engagement with the team too i mean you, you're, you're gonna buy a, a soto shuffle shirt like you are a nats fan or at least a Juan soto fan for life and that it's hard to value that really and so you're, you're doing a hell of a, a favor for the, these teams as well part of the reason i love that one is just like it was so specific like he's always done the soto shuffle but when they got on the national stage it became a national thing yeah. and that's when we did the shirt it was like in the moment but we created it in a way we captured that in a way that it's like evergreen and it's always going to be one of my favorite shirts. Like I'm always going to wear that and people are going to, it's going to be a conversation starter in like the year 2029. It wasn't just of 2019. That I love that. He'll be, he'll be around 700, 700 runs by then. <laughs> uh, number three for you, James. Uh, tell me the most memorable story looking back here for the wind days. Uh, the most memorable story or article from uh, from FTW. Oh my gosh! Uh, for the win. So what? This is a weirdly memorable, and it ties back to the whole discussion about native video and distributed content. Is we started dabbling in like Facebook video, mm-hmm. and I don't even know how we got our hands on it, but it was a video from the UK of like a f- soccer game, but the game was like you kick the ball at like a giant dartboard like the size of like the size of the side of a barn you know and like the ball would stick to the velcro board like a dart would stick to the wall it was stupid video you know (laughs) and we posted it on our facebook page we didn't even have that many followers and it did like 55 million views it was like 50 million plus views oh wow and this is at a time when like native video was like everybody was trying to figure out like, oh my gosh, what do we need to do with Facebook video? What's our strategy? And this like popped off in such a big way. And it was such an anomaly. It was like a, it was like a lightning bolt. Um, but it just stuck, stick, sticks out to me because it was like so silly and so meaningless. But it became this thing that was probably on like corporate pitch decks for the next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know what I'll be doing tonight. I, I will be going down the rabbit hole to look for that video later. So I, I got my, my night planned. <laughs> yep. All right. Next up for you, Jamie, t- tell me your favorite sports media outlet today and, and why, w- w- if, if you can name one without, uh, without picking favorites. My favorite sports media outlet. Oh, that's so, that's so tough because the only one I subscribe to, I think is the Washington post because they just happen to cover all my favorite DC sports teams. And then I kind of cheat. I kind of just like, I use Twitter and the nuzzle app. Okay. To like consume all my content. So it's this weird, like, you know, it's more about like the, the people I follow. Uh, I, th- I really like the ringer, like the ringer just really hits on a lot of my interests. Um, so I'll go with like Washington post, the ringer, and all the randos I follow on Twitter. <laughs> nice. I like it. Uh, how about in, in real life as a fan, the most memorable game that you've attended? When George Mason beat UConn to go to the Final Four on what was more or less their home court in Washington, D.C. My brother was an undergrad at Mason at the time, and we wow. were both. we were bo- both at AOL. He has an intern. I as a, a content producer. And so we got media passes and we were front row for that game, George Mason. I mean, it was just like an unbelievable moment. I mean, it it seems to have happened now more frequently where like a double digit seed, like a VCU or a St. Mary's or whatever will make it to the, uh, not St. Mary's, Loyola Chicago will make it to the final four. But that felt so unique and special at the time. They were on the cover of Sports Illustrated that week when that sort of meant something. Uh, So yeah, George Mason, final four. That was, that's a great one. That, I definitely remember watching that one. That, that, that was the original run, it seemed like, uh, to the Final Four. Uh, number, number seven, uh, the social platform that performs best for breaking tea. And, and also, if it's different, the, the platform or platform feature that you're kind of high on for the future. Uh, you know, we, I would say Instagram. Um, we really only, 
operate on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Mm -hmm. And of those three, Instagram is the one where we do both organic and paid. You know, we, we do both of those things. Whereas like Facebook, it's a little bit more like paid focus. Twitter's mm -hmm. more organic focus. And like Instagram's where, we, where those things kind of overlap. Um, I so I, I would go with that. I, my thing that bugs me about Instagram is I come from the generation of like, I'm more of like a Facebook Twitter guy and like a blog guy where things are very shareable, linkable. They exist like on the open web and like can kind of go off. Whereas I feel like Instagram, especially anything stories or anything like fleets now with Twitter, it's very, to me, it's like very closed off. Mm -hmm. Like even though it might be consumed and like get a ton of engagement or whatever, uh, I, it, it's like, I, there's something I, I can't quite adhere to it. I'm much more like, give me a link. I need a link. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need something I can quickly, quickly share, quickly text somebody quickly, uh, you know, just push a button to make it, make it viral. I, I blame Snapchat. Snapchat was like the first social platform where I was like, not really participating. <laughs> and, now, oh, yeah. and, and now it's like, now it's TikTok. And I think, I think I'm just now on the, on the downside of the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're going to ask the food question. If I come out there, visit you in Wilmington, where's the best, what's the best meal to get? Where, where do we get it? Well, I, I mean, for me, it's like, it's actually at a, a, a town called Southport. It's like 30 minute drive from Wilmington, but it's this little place called provision company. It's in a, a marina where like the fish boats come in and out and they have a very small menu of like fresh seafood. You order at the counter, they bring it to you on the deck you, if you want a beer, you go grab it out of the cooler. I mean, that provision company in Southport, North Carolina is, is my happy place. I love it. That sounds great. Fresh seafood always sounds good to me. Uh, yeah. Last before you, Jamie, before you get this episode, shout outs. Um, just uh, real quick, tell me the, the, the college or pro sports team with the most rapid fan base on breaking tea, like which, which fan base will just eat up anything you put out there right now. It's the Padres. The Padres are, are just so hype. Uh, and, and I, I really hope this season goes well for them, uh, because I, I'm, I'm hyped for them as a fan, but we're doing great Padres business. Their organization is great on the field and off. Um, and it's funny because like a year ago, the Padres would have been like our like 30th team in, <laughs> in baseball in baseball alone, but they're just, yeah, they're, they're going off right now. So I'll go with the Padres. I, as a lifelong Padres fan, I will, I would love to hear that. Yeah. Slam Diego all the way, man. Oh, that was amazing. That, the quick breaking two stories. Slam Diego happened and we did like the, the fourth night in a row where they hit a grand slam happened and the, this team rebranded itself Slam Diego on social. We did a, I think we did a design that night, had it to market online the next day and the team all wanted it for BP <laughs> the next day. So this is like, I don't know, let's just say it happened Thursday night. They wanted to be wearing it on Saturday. And uh, so we hustled. I mean, we used a local printer in San Diego. Our wow. team just like made it happen, you know, like made the magic happen. And the whole team was wearing the Slam Diego shirts during BP. They won the game. And uh, Tatis went on SportsCenter, uh, the big interview with SVP mm -hmm. that night. And he was wearing Slam Diego, and it was like the whole thing was just so beautiful. I I, I love it. That's I mean, we. It's it's sort of silly, but like we we live for that. It was magic. Oh, that's amazing. I, I love that. All right, JB. I loved loved the quick hitters. Now your chance to take over the podcast. Tell us your social media all star follow. Uh, can be any any platform. Uh, just tell us who they are and why they're following. Social media all star follow. Oh man, I, I was not prepared for this one. I looked over the the the, uh, the timeline or the uh, outline. <laughs> Social media all star follow. Who can I come up with off the top? Um, I love. I'll go with uh, Jason Concepcion. I already mentioned the Ringer. He's kind of moved on, but I, I love uh, Network. I just I love the way he kind of looks at sports and culture and and gives you a, a, a funny but you know in, informed and like you know thoughtful and caring point of view on things nice i like that one and, and how about you jamie where can we find you as well as all things breaking tea on digital social you know i've got a good name for this um at jamie Matram 
is available on everything apparently because that's me that's me wherever i am at jamie Matram. that's that's on gmail that's on twitter that's everywhere beautiful mm -hmm. check out jamie check out breaking tea all over i think there, you guys are at breaking tea on all platforms i'm pretty sure right yep that's right cool anytime something happens you will quickly see breaking tea ready in the moment and now we know a little bit as to why and just what an exciting space to continue to watch and a tremendous insightful interview i really appreciate you taking the time with jamie thanks so much this is really fun and if anybody wants to learn more please don't hesitate to contact me uh i like talking about myself <laughs> <laughs> we love listening to it thank you so much again jamie to jamie Matram, president of breaking tea just super knowledgeable about this space uh has a passion for it can talk about it um and meets my passion as well for sure and just cannot thank him enough for coming on the podcast today but that'll do it for this episode of the Digital and Social Media Sports Podcast. Again, check out the podcast, subscribe, follow on all your favorite podcast platforms. Visit the website, dsmsports.net, for more episodes and content. Follow me, Neil Horwitz, your host, on LinkedIn, where I post more content, as well as on Twitter, njh287. Until next time, this is Neil Horwitz signing off for the Digital and Social Media Sports Podcast.